Okay, let's walk through the joint structures of the upper limb of the human body. The handout that we're using shows all of the joints within the human body that we'll learn in this course. The first page shows the fibrous joints and the cartilaginous joints. And here between these two, there's only a single joint that we need to learn that is associated with the upper limb. And that's in the fibrous category. The upper limb has 12 named joints altogether, but just one in this fibrous category. And it's a syndesmosis. Syndesmosis, as you re remember, is a joint that contains fairly large pieces of dense fibrous connective tissue. Um, and here, these two bones are the, known as the radius and the ulna. And the radial ulnar joint is this connective tissue between them. It's technically referred to as an interosseous membrane. And it joins the two bones from one end to the other and keeps them from coming apart. So the bones in your forearm are locked together by this and this forms the joint then between the two bones. Of the 12 upper limb joints, then, 11 of these joints are synovial, and at least one is found in each of the six categories of synovial joints. So, the first one that we want to identify is in the pivot category, and is known as the radiohumeral joint right here and it is found between the capitulum of the humerus the lateral condyle there and the radius and this allows for a rotating action we have an action of the forearm where without moving the shoulder or the elbow of the arm you can rotate your forearm and your hand palm down and palm up. And this action is facilitated by this specialized joint at the elbow that allows the radius, the lateral of the two bones, to rotate against the capitulum of the humerus. So a rotating joint, a pivot joint, is the radiohumeral there are also two hinge joints, and one of these is a repeat. So although we have 12 upper limb joints, if you've previously studied the lower limb and studied the toes, you, you learned that there were interphalangeal joints in the toes. And here they are again, the joints between the bones of the fingers, the phalanges, are known as the interphalangeal joints. And being that there are several phalanges in each finger, there are a couple of joints in each one as well. The other pivot joint is known as the cubital joint. The cubital joint is at the elbow as well, right next to the radiohumeral joint. It's the ulna and the humerus. And the term cubital is used for many, many things in and around the elbow area of the human body. So <clears throat> anytime you see this, you would know that. The cubital comes from the word cubit, which is actually an ancient term of measurement. Um, several thousand, two, three thousand, maybe more than that years ago, um, the term cubit has been used for the distance between the elbow and the tip of your finger. So basically the forearm and hand in ancient times were used as a measuring device. And that measurement length was referred to as a cubit. If you're familiar with the story of Noah's Ark in the Bible, um, if you go to the book of Genesis and read the story, there's actually a measurement of the length, the height, and the width of this very large boat, and it's all measured in cubits. 
So a word that comes from a long time ago, but used today in terms of various features of the elbow. And here, it's the hinging joint of the elbow. Now that's two categories in the synovial area. Let's look at two more. The next two in your list are the saddle and the ellipsoid. And the one and only saddle joint is here, referred to as carpometacarpal pollicis. And the carpometacarpal would tell us that it's between the carpals, which are the short bones in the base of the hand, and the metacarpals, which are the long bones that run through the palm of the hand. And right where the base of those metacarpals meet the little carpal bones, those are the metacarpal joints. But this isn't just any carpometacarpal joint, of which there are several. This is the pollicis joint. This is the joint at the thumb. Uh, in Latin, the word for your thumb is your pollex, P-O-L-L-E-X, and the adjective is the word you see here, pollicis, which basically means of the thumb. So this is the carpometacarpal joint at the base of the thumb. And it's a saddle joint, which allows for biaxial motion. And the key here is that it allows your thumb to swing in to the palm of your hand and be used with your fingers to grip or pinch things. The um, opposable thumb is what it's called because it can work in opposition to each of your fingers. And so it makes the hand an important thing for using tools. Only human beings and a few species of apes have a thumb with a saddle joint. Uh, many other animals have a thumb digit. Your cat or your dog has a thumb digit, but it only works like a finger in a hinging way. It does not swing into the palm of the hand to be used there. So this is quite a special joint in terms of what it does and what it allows human beings to do. The other category shown here is the ellipsoid category, and there are two joints here in the ellipsoid category. So, pollux for thumb. Um, the two here are the metacarpophalangeal, and as the name implies, these are the long bones on the palm of the hand joined to the proximal phalanges of each of the fingers. Uh, in English, most people refer to this uh, this joint as their knuckles. If you make a fist um, right where your fingers meet your hand, the joints stick out quite a bit, and most people refer to those as your knuckles. They're an ellipsoid joint because not only do your fingers hinge where they, re where they connect to your hand, but you can also spread them side to side, or in our technical vernacular, you can abduct and adduct your fingers there. The other thing that you can abduct and adduct is the radiocarpal joint, which is the wrist joint. Um, this is where your hand bends in relationship to your forearm. And it's primarily a joint, as you can see in this picture, between the radius and the carpal bones. The ulna is also there but 90% of the joint is between the hand bones, the carpals, and the radius. Uh, an ellipsoid joint, because your hand does hinge at your wrist, but it can also abduct and adduct. So, two joints in the ellipsoid category. Finally, there are two last categories within the synovial category, and that's the ball and socket and the plane. <clears throat> uh, one of the two ball and socket joints is here, the one at the shoulder. This is referred to as the glenohumeral. And you'll understand this a little bit better from your study of the bones. The glenoid fossa of the scapula is the receiving cup-like structure, kind of like the acetabulum in the 
and the coxa of the lower limb and the ball head of the, of the humerus will fit into that. So the shoulder joint is referred to as glenohumeral. In the plane category, there are four joints, two of them in the hand. So let's look at the structure of the hand here. And first of all, the other carpometacarpal joints are here. Uh, perhaps you remember just moments ago, we talked of the saddle joint, the one and only saddle joint we're going to learn, which is called the metacarpal or carpometacarpal pollicis joint. That was the one carpometacarpal that was at the base of the thumb. The other four metacarpals form joints with the carpals, and these are the other carpometacarpal joints. And then, of course, there would also be the intercarpal joints. These would be the, if there are eight little carpal bones at the base of the hand, these would be the little flat surfaces where these little bones rub against one another. So there are many intercarpal joints and several carpometacarpals that are here. Those are in the hand. The other two plane joints are found in the shoulder, and these have to do with the bone that's called the clavicle. <clears throat> the clavicle forms a joint at either end, and the joint in the center is called sternoclavicular. This would be at the proximal or the medial end of the clavicle, your collarbone. And it sits on and joints to the sternum, which is the term or the name for the breast bone. The, the bone that runs right down the center of your chest is your sternum. And so the joint where the clavicle sits on the sternum is just a plain joint referred to as sternoclavicular. The other end of the clavicle, the distal end or the lateral end, is jointed to the scapula, the shoulder blade, and that joint is referred to as a chromioclavicular. And that is because the feature of the scapula that it joints to is called the acromion process. So this is a chromioclavicular. As you know, the scapula, better and better, you will see and understand where the clavicle then joints to it. So four plane joints, two in the hand and two at the ends of the clavicle. So there are the 12 upper limb joints. The one upper limb joint here in the fibrous joints called the radial ulnar and then in the synovial category there are 11 and uh, we detail these. One pivot, two hinge, one saddle joint, two ellipsoid, one ball and socket, and four plane joints. For each of the joints, you need to know its name, you need to know where it's located, and you should be able to tell which one of the categories it's in. For example, if you were asked uh, what type of joint is a cubital joint, you'd be able to say that's a synovial hinge joint. Or if someone asked um, where is the glenohumeral joint, you could say it's between the scapula and the humerus or even the glenoid fossa, the scapula, and the head of the humerus. So, many of these joints tell you which two bones they interact with. And there's just one or two here that would be ones that you would just have to know and memorize, like the cubital joint. Okay, so good luck. Work with these. And there we have our... 12 joints of the upper limb.